Great, so continuing the trend of this room, I'm gonna have another talk about bots. Um, this one is more about a good bot. So in this case, we are building a chat application to bring employees into the incident response uh, pipeline and involve them by uh, chatting with them. So before we get started, I wanna talk a little bit about myself. Um, I've been with Pinterest a year and a half, focused on the infrastructure security team where we build out systems, so we develop internal tools that help engineers develop more secure code. In particular, I've focused on things like service identity uh, and incident response, as is the topic of this talk. Before Pinterest, I was a student at University of Maryland where I studied computer science and cybersecurity. So to kick things off, I wanna start off by discussing the motivation for why you might wanna take this approach for its incident response. What does a chat application uh, sort of what are the benefits of that? And what can it provide you that a more traditional system would not? We're gonna move on and talk a little bit about the technical design, how we built this thing, and then show some screenshots and uh, of typical interactions, what the product looks like internally at Pinterest today, how we use it. Finally, I wanna give you all takeaways so that when you're considering developing programs similar to this internally, uh, what lessons you can learn from our mistakes. So why would you wanna build this chat application? I can think of a few reasons, or maybe a couple hundred reasons, uh, especially when you're in a small security team, but even at scale, your team can be inundated with alerts. You can get a huge volume that it's just very impractical for individuals to go through and hand inspect, um, including uh, as these alerts grow in size, it's very easy to lose that one critical alert that's buried in the middle. There are a bunch of other pain points I've listed out, uh, particularly a lot of the alerts that we were seeing were generated by users, right? These are actions that employees take in their day-to-day -day jobs that aren't necessarily suspicious 100% of the time, but we do wanna be logging and alerting on those things and making sure that employees are aware that those are potentially sensitive actions. We also want to maintain transparency inter internally. We want employees to know what we consider security risks, and we want to build awareness of our security programs. Finally, there's a lot of call and response when dealing with alerts that are generated by users, right? It looks a little bit like this. A security team member finds an alert. They reach out to an employee to figure out what was the context of that? Why did this happen? And then they're in meetings for a couple hours, so you don't hear back. And then you're in a meet meeting for a couple hours, so you can't get back to them to follow up. And it just keeps going back and forth, and it takes a while to resolve those alerts. So how does a security bot solve all these problems? Well, from the call and response side, cutting that round trip time in half by having a bot that's always there to respond to users uh, cuts that in half. From the side of education, right, we're alerting users specifically on what actions we consider sensitive. The information is provided to them in this application so they know what we consider risks. Finally, in terms of generate and high volume of alerts, these are both things that are solved by surfacing the alerts directly to the users because they have the most context so they know what events um, they perform in their day-to-day -day, day -day jobs and whether that action was done by them or something else was going on. So in terms of how we built this thing, I wanna give a high level overview first. This is what the general architecture looks like. So at the top left, we have our existing alerting pipeline, right? Previously, most of our alerts would come in through email or a page. Um, this is an additional uh, stream that alerts can go through, specifically when they're associated with an end user in our, in our company. We use Amazon SQS for this, but it could be really any messaging or queuing service. From there, we populate these alerts back into a database for permanent storage so we can resurface those alerts when doing investigations um, and have that data there available all the time. Security bot, the thing in the middle, that's sort of the critical piece here. That's what goes to that database, fetches alerts, figures out what to do with them, whether it needs to reach out to an employee to follow up, get more information, resolve that alert. Um, and that's done through direct messages in Slack. In addition to those direct messages, we also have a separate private channel that security team has access to where escalations happen 
and the security team has access to a bunch of different commands that I'll go through later to surface more information about alerts and manage the system. Finally, we use Duo as our two-factor authentication for verifying that when a user acknowledges an alert, that it was indeed them that did it uh, through this out-of-band means. This is the typical flow of an alert um, that an, a regular employee would see. So initially, we reach out to them and give them a short sentence description of what the event was, right? So in this case, I was doing a bulk download of Google Drive, which you could imagine could be a little suspicious. I might be doing some data exfiltration or something. Uh, so we want to make sure with the user that that was a legitimate thing that they were doing. Uh, following that sort of brief description of the alert, we have the more verbose details describing exactly what happened. So here we have timestamps, we have dates, we have IP addresses, names. Uh, in this case, because it's Google Drive, we have um, document titles, the number of documents, all sorts of information that's very specific to the application that we're alerting on. Finally, at the bottom, we have this call to action that requests our employee reply yes or no, and then potentially give us a little bit of context so that if we do need to go deeper and dig in and do an investigation, that we have some context as to what was happening here. Uh, in this case, I reply yes, and then the duo push is sent to my phone where I can reply and have that cache for a couple hours to avoid bugging me constantly if I have a bunch of alerts happen in the morning. Now, in terms of the actual structure of Security Bot, we took a multi-agent approach. So we broke it into a bunch of different processes all running on the same host that have their own unique purpose. Um, part of this is to isolate us from any failures in one agent taking down the whole system, um, which I'll get into a bit later. Uh, so agent one's purpose, this is mostly data backfill type thing. So it watches that SQSQ we have and populates that data back into our RDS database for storage. Agent two is where things get a little more interesting. That's where we make that initial call out to a user, ask them, hey, was this you? Can you provide some details? Um, and give that initial request. In addition to that, we have a couple escalations that can happen at that stage. Uh, so for example, if the alert is something that we consider very high priority and we want the security team to know about right away, we'll escalate it at this time. Uh, in addition, sometimes uh, our alerting system will feed in uh, alerts that aren't necessarily associated with a user that exists in Slack, or maybe there's a mismatch between someone's LDAP credentials and their Slack credentials. Uh, so this would also get escalated in agent two. Agent three is responsible for responding to users and handling all their different commands that they can do. So in this case, that's that yes and no command. Security team has a bunch of commands that they can run to manage the system, as well as there are a few informational commands for users to use as well. Uh, so agent three is always listening and replying to those. Once a user replies yes to a message, agent three is responsible for initiating that 2FA handshake um, and escalating alerts if the user replies no. Finally, agent four is focused more on cleanup. So this is um, archiving those alerts once a user has acknowledged them um, and resolved that 2FA push, as well as escal escalating alerts if it times out. So if the user hasn't replied in a long time and is ignoring security bot, or uh, if 2FA fails for some reason. So if the user doesn't have 2FA set up on their phone or it's an old version or something, uh, it would get escalated at this stage. As you can imagine, there are a lot of different use cases for a bot like this. Basically, any alert that's associated with an employee uh, can be tied into a system like this. There are a couple of use cases that I want to go through from a sort of general perspective, though. Uh, corporate productivity tools, think things like G Suite, uh, Dropbox, single sign-on providers, all of these things um, every employee uses you know, day to day, and there could be sensitive actions that happen on those. So monitoring that and sending alerts uh, is very useful there. One example uh, from the previous slides was that bulk data exfil type um, incident. The next type is these cloud actions. So AWS, GCP, Azure, if you're running in one of these platforms, uh, there are a lot of sensitive APIs that are exposed to your employees. Um, now, obviously, you'll lock some of these down, but employees do need access to use some of these uh, internally to do their jobs. So as a result, you're going to want to monitor them, 
and send them alerts to make sure that it was really them that performed that action. One thing that we're looking at is IAM policies. So if a user modifies the permissions of a particular machine, uh, that would be something that we would alert on. Host level monitoring is more specific to the actual infrastructure. Uh, so all the hosts running internally, uh, you're gonna want, wanna watch for things that are happening on them. Uh, for example, if an employee installs Bitcoin mining on one of your internal systems, you're gonna wanna follow up with them and make sure that that was a legitimate thing that they uh, really needed to do for their job. Uh, finally, there's the internal tool use case. This is sort of very open-ended, very specific to your infrastructure and how you do things at your company. Uh, but one example of a like, non-proprietary internal tool that we use at Pinterest that uh, we do have alerts around is Kubernetes. Uh, so here there are a lot of sensitive uh, APIs similar to the cloud um, APIs that are exposed to employees, so we wanna have alerts to verify their actions. So what does this system actually look like? How do we use it today? As I mentioned before, there are two primary channels of interaction with SecurityBot. There's the direct message that it sends to a user to verify an alert, and then there is the security private channel where messages, um, or where alerts are escalated and where a security team can surface information about the system. From the employee side, uh, this is what they see when they run help. There's not a whole lot here other than a bunch of sort of informational, um, sort of gimmicky stuff. There's not too much that an employee will actually use here. In fact, um, the two commands that aren't on that list are yes and no. Uh, so we do include these in the footer of every alert message, just as that final call to action to say, hey, please uh, follow up. Tell us whether this alert was you, if you recognize it. If not, escalate it to us and provide a context if necessary. So the security side is where things get a little more interesting. We have a lot more commands that, at our disposal. Um, I'm gonna break these into three sort of general classes and go through them one by one. The first set is these list commands. So in this case, we want to see all of the escalated alerts in the system so that we can do our investigations and follow up with employees. Uh, so list will give you information about uh, timestamp, the user associated with it, the actual event that happened, and then the reason it was escalated and uh, time that it happened. Uh, in addition to just the standard list command, we also support list idle, which shows those alerts that I mentioned before, where an employee was maybe in a meeting, they weren't able to reply right away, uh, so we have a special distinction there of, um, we haven't escalated it yet, it hasn't quite been enough time to notify the security team, but we are marking that as a potential risk that we want to surface separately. Uh, so that is what the list idle command will do, and it's the same output. Summary gives you the more high-level overview of the system. So this is, rather than getting specific individual alerts, you just want to see how many alerts are in my system, what are the various states that they're in, so have they been resolved, or um, are they escalated to the security team. And we use colors to denote in a very quick and easy to see way. Um, here the red are alerts that have been escalated that security team needs to investigate. Yellow are those alerts that are still traveling through our pipeline, uh, so we're still giving employees a chance to follow up on those. And then green are those that are in a good state and that we have either resolved or the employee has acknowledged. Uh, the summary command has a couple different options here. So by default, it shows the past 24 hours of data. You can supply an uh, hour range and that'll give you more detail on a specific um, di different range of hours. Uh, you can also dial in on the alert state. So here, uh, idle is one state. So if I did summary idle, I would get a similar output, but just for the alerts that were in that specific state. We also support summary long, uh, which looks like the output on this slide. Uh, so it's much more verbose, and it gives you those individual alert IDs and the actual events that happened. Uh, so that's what you use if you need to get more details about a particular alert. Finally, we have um, actions for specific alert management. So in this case, view and resolve. They do what they say they do, but view will show you all the information associated with an alert. Uh, you can surface all the context, um, get that um, application-specific details, which I've blocked out here, but um, 
Also timestamp, uh, the username, and uh, location. Resolve is what the security team uses once they've completed an investigation and want to archive that alert. Uh, we just use resolve with the alert name. So I've mentioned states a couple times in the context of alerts. Um, this is a diagram showing all the different states that an alert can go through. It's a bit convoluted, so I'll go through it uh, case by case. The good case here is we generate a new alert. It goes to the user in Slack. They reply yes. We send a duo push. They acknowledge that push, and then we acknowledge that alert. So that's then in a good state. The second sort of good case that happens pretty frequently is this suppression on the left. Uh, so this is to avoid spamming users if they perform the same or very similar action in a very short period of time. We have a small suppression window that avoids spam, basically. Um, so we're looking for same user, uh, same event type or class of event, uh, and similar resources. Uh, finally, the timeout case, so this is in purple here. <clears throat> if the user ignores the alert at any point in the blue steps, um, so while they're sort of staying in Slack or even if they let Duo sit there for a while, um, we will uh, mark that alert as idle after about 30 minutes. Um, this is just to give us the distinction. Um, we didn't feel it was fair to immediately escalate an alert um, if that employee was in a meeting, for example, and couldn't get to their phone right away. Um, once an alert is in that idle state, they can sort of resurface that by replying yes, and they will re-enter the uh, blue flow. <clears throat> Finally, in red are the bad states. So user doesn't exist. Uh, it's a critical alert. We Actually, my diagram's a little off here, but we bypass idle and go directly to escalated in that case. Um, and then if the user replies no at any point in time or their duo fails, um, we will escalate that as well. Once an alert's in that escalated state, uh, it can't get back into a good state until a security team member does an investigation and resolves that individually. We've built out a couple dashboards to help our, our team um, sort of surface alerts, search them, and uh, get system summaries outside of Slack. It's not always easy to sort of dig deep when you have to type all these commands. Um, so this is basically just a search interface. We provide all these different fields that you can search on. Uh, keyword's very useful, but also the username, as well as the different states that an alert uh, are in. So if you, for example, only care about escalated alerts related to uh, Kubernetes, you could search that here. In addition to that sort of search interface, we also have a general purpose dashboard that gives the more uh, sort of summary of the system. Here at the top, we have the three main classes of alerts that we care about. Uh, so new alerts that just entered the system, timed out, so that's the idle state where a user has been in meetings or something, um, they're ignoring the security bot, and then escalated, those are the alerts that we actually care about, have to do an investigation, um, and as you can see here, we have one that we need to take a look at. Finally, I wanna go over four main takeaways um, that hopefully will empower you guys to go and build out similar systems uh, and learn from our mistakes. First up, keep everything very simple. Uh, if you wanna roll out a program like this to all of your employees, not everyone's an engineer, not everyone knows what an IP address is, right? It's very helpful to dial those alerts down into a very easily digestible uh, few word summary that an employee can look at and say, yes, I know I did that, or no, I have no idea what that is, and escalate it or acknowledge it appropriately. In addition, from the um, sort of non-user facing side of things, try to keep the design as simple as possible. So that alert uh, state diagram I showed on a couple slides back, we didn't think about that before building out this system. And it ended up being a bit of a pain to go back and sort of rework things so that it followed a more streamlined design. Um, in addition to keeping the design simple, suppression is a very important thing. So brief uh, side rant here. A couple months ago, we had an employee that was using Terraform to bulk spin up a bunch of new infrastructure in AWS. Uh, and Terraform basically just makes a bunch of API calls to AWS. 
Our existing alerting pipeline didn't treat those as uh, one event. It treated those as a bunch of different individual events. So we ended up sending this one employee hundreds of Slack messages over the course of a day, and they just could not even use Slack for that whole day because they were just so many alerts. Um, so it's very important up front, think about those sort of bulk use cases, um, what actions are performed frequently and together. Um, make sure you have a sane suppression policy. Try not to make it too forgiving, but find that balance. Uh, next up, not all alerts are equal. So some alerts, obviously, you want the security team to be involved right away, right? Uh, it's something very sensitive. You need to escalate it directly to them. But other alerts, you can wait a couple hours or a day or two while the employee uh, is reached out to and sort of there's a communication there. So make sure you spend some time classifying your alerts, figuring out what needs to get escalated, what doesn't, and have those policies in place uh, ahead of time. Last but not least, measurement, super important, um, specifically uh, for two reasons. One, measurement will help you feed back into your development lifecycle. So um, knowing how many users are actually participating, how many are just ignoring it altogether, uh, what's the general mean response time. Uh, gathering data like this will help you drive your development forward and figure out uh, what needs to change, how can you improve that program. Second reason being you can uh, use these statistics to sort of justify the program and show its success. Uh, are employees actually engaged in this? Do they feel like they're learning about security? Uh, is their awareness of what is considered a risk or not actually being raised? So these are all very important things to consider as you go about building out a similar process. Uh, before I wrap up, I just want to I want to thank the team at Pinterest for helping me build this out and dog food it as well, so especially that guy that got hundreds of messages, um, thanks to him. Uh, I'd also like to specifically call out there's some further reading at the end of my slides. Both Slack and Dropbox have done this before, and we based our model uh, heavily off of what they did. Um, Dropbox actually has an open source version, uh, so I really recommend you guys checking that out. With all that said, thank you so much. You've been a great audience, and that's all I have.